Welcome to my world. I'm your host, Kevin Rutherford. It is Monday, October 7th. We are here live. It is a free-for-all today. Anything goes. I'll be joined by my co-host, Brent Hutto, from truckstop.com here shortly. I don't see him here yet, but I uh, understand he will be here soon. So we'll, uh, oh, I think I see him there. I think he just popped in. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and grab that call. Brent, good morning. Good morning, KR. I'm on the road again, my brother. I'm live from Charleston, South Carolina. <laughs> what a Except gr- this time, this is a couple. This is a couple vacation days for for my wife and I. So having a, we had a really fun time in Charleston. Well, I was going to say, you picked a great place. I love Charleston. Oh my! Oh my gosh! It's you know, I mean, maybe I should have paid attention more in high school to my history teacher, or maybe even middle school or elementary school. I was I was more interested in getting outside, probably yeah. just like you. But uh, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, Charleston is. I mean, you know, people go to Boston for U.S. history. They go to Philadelphia for U.S. history. Charleston is like right. It's it's the same as those cities. Yeah. But for the South, I didn't. I mean, it's amazing the history here. My my wife and I came down for four days and right now we're on the way to Chicago for a, I'm going, I'm going to the a big a broker conference and I'm also going to speak to a bunch of bankers up there at another conference. And uh, so, but this city is just amazing, man. I, I, it's beautiful. And I tell you, here's the best part of it. The best part of it, KR is the people of Charleston are so welcoming. I mean, you don't yeah. pass a person. They don't say hi. Now I know that's typical in the South, but it's really typical here in Charleston. It's a super great city. Yeah, it is. A lot of fun. I haven't been there in a while, but I uh, every time I go, I always have a good time. Good seafood, too. Can't beat the seafood. Oh, goodness. Goodness. We've had oysters. We had lobster. We had all yeah. kinds of It was so good. It was like this is a this is a uh, my wife and I delayed our anniversary, our wedding anniversary celebration to this weekend. So that's why we kind of we kind of uh, put on the dog, as they say, we say in Alabama. We just had a great time here. Good, good. So. Last week, when you and I were talking, we thought the uh, yes, the, the strike was going to be a big deal, and it kind of fizzled. Well, I, if you remember what I said, was labor was going to win, and maybe I didn't say this last week, but people kept saying, oh, it's going to go a long time, and I said, nope, it's not. It's not going to go a long time, and uh, I'm glad it fizzled. Obviously, for the U.S. freight marketplace and for the citizens, uh, it fizzled out. I've been right, right when the strike ended, I got here. So I haven't paid much attention to the news because I, I, I committed to my wife to just have a really, really just a uh, husband and wife weekend. And so I haven't paid a whole lot of attention to it. So I do know it ended, which a lot of people, when I was in the airport, they were talking about it. Cause I'm in this is Charleston's obviously a port city. Yeah. So, right. um, so yeah. So, so what, what any, what's the, what's the big news about the, 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 the outcome from the pork strike? Port well, strike? The, the big news really is that, would they just kick the can down the road on some of these issues and there still is a chance of a strike? I think it's like 105 or 110 days or heads up. They're going to be back at it again oh, in that's January. All? Oh, goodness. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Come on. Yeah. It, <laughs> it, it sounds like they agreed to the wage hike. They settled on like 60 some percent. 60. Wage yeah, hike. I yeah, I saw that. I saw that. Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a. That's a huge way. When you're talking business, anything that goes up 60% <laughs> is big. That's uh, the, I, I don't know where they are on the automation. It, it sounded like they were fairly right. close on a lot of things, but they yeah. certainly mentioned that um, there is a, the potential for a strike. One of the writers that I follow said, you can just about bet there will be a strike. Well, I'm wondering why they, you know, there's always strategy and politics in these things where, you know, there's always a, well, we'll get this now and then we'll wait and do this later and sort of thing. It's always a massive, I'll tell you, the thing that gets me with the ports and look, I'm all for the port workers, you know, making a, a, a great living or making whatever wherever they, they can figure out in their jobs, but it shows you. And you think about 66% increase over what five or six years. I can't remember how what the time period six, was, but I think, I mean, I don't, I don't see, I don't see truckers having the ability to be able to do that and negotiate. And it's because we're in a competitive open marketplace, right? Correct. But you know, what's not competitive is the labor pool at the ports. 
right? Because it's all one pool. So that that's why um, that leverage. That's why when I when I was looking at the you know, what was going on, uh, I just felt like labor was going to win really really quickly because what what else are they going to do? And and that's that's unfortunate that that's the case. But the thing that that gets me, and I have you, I don't know if you've heard anything on this. So, you know, the West Coast ports renegotiated as well last year for, for a 36 percent increase. Right. Is there any like, uh, wait, a, wait a minute. This isn't fair. Yeah. <laughs> Is there any any talk about, about about them renegotiating, trying to renegotiate there? Yeah. Who knows? Uh, you know, the the interesting thing is, and we're going to talk some about economics today. You know, I, I have to check. I'm pretty sure you were the one that recommended the book Economics in One Lesson, right? I did. I and did. And you just Absolutely. brought it Henry up again yep. last week, right? I did. I did. So, Absolutely. So you want to know what's interesting? I When you mentioned Tell it me. again last week and with everything going on in politics and economics and the talk of wage controls and price controls, I'm like, I, I, I better go read this book. So I thought, all right, I probably already have this on my Kindle because we've talked about it a lot. So I was searching my Kindle and I couldn't find it. I'm like, all right, well, maybe I didn't get this one. So I go to buy it. Luckily, Amazon always warns you. Sure enough, it was already on my Kindle. I don't know why I couldn't find it in a search, except maybe, maybe I I did some digging into my Kindle for the, the first place. It turns out that I bought this book in 2020. I guess you've been telling me You're about this me. one for a while. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised, but I am amazed. <laughs> so then I thought, maybe my Kindle's more out of control than I thought. So I started playing around trying to sort things, because it, it's out of control. It used to be as soon as I read a book, I would delete it off my Kindle, so I wouldn't get confused. Right. Well, over time, with all the extra books and stuff I was buying, I got lazy, and I haven't deleted any books in a long time. So that's why I'm having a hard time finding things. So I realized I could sort by unread. Well, when I first did it, Ah, I I had a little moment of panic. I'm like, come on, it can't be that bad. It says I have over 900 unread items on my Kindle. Uh, Kevin, I might suggest some therapy for you at this point. (laughs) <laughs> you may so, have a problem. <laughs> so it turns out it, it's it's not quite as bad as it sounded because when I travel, I get both versions of a book written and audio because I can just go back and forth. The technology is amazing. Right. I can drive all day listening to a book. And when I pull over and pull out my Kindle and open it up, the book I'm reading will be left. It, it will be right where I left off when I was listening. It's just right. so I can go back and forth. So some of it was doubles because I had the audio on there. And I also realized that some books, I'm, I'm pretty good at finishing a book. If I start a book, it's hard for me to stop reading it. I do it once in a while, but not very right. often. But what I realized, some books have so many references that you'll be, 60% of the way done with the book and the book ends. The rest of the book is just all references oh, and, right. and, yeah, a, yeah, yeah. and a bibliography. And if you don't go through it all, it doesn't show that book as being completely read. So, Oh, well, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. so I got to go through. I think what I'm going to do, it's about time for a new Kindle. Um, I think I'm just going to get a new Kindle and then not load all this stuff up onto it rather than trying to clean this well, one off. I think it's too far gone. Yeah, I know you're a reader like my wife is. I, you know, the word, that the adjective would be voracious. Yeah. And uh, she loves her Kindle. She loves her Kindle. Oh, Just me too. It. Me too. Uh, but yeah. this one, this one's a little out of control. So might be time to do a, a reset. So the book itself was really interesting. Thank you, by the way. No, oh, it's it's. Oh, uh, you're, I've loved it. It's been so, it opens your eyes and it, it helps you understand, uh, economic principles and in a real simple way. And it, to me, it just, anything that helps me go, Oh, that's why that works that way. Or, Oh, that's why the government makes a decision like this. Yeah. Then you, you, you start to get it. And man, I'm all life. I mean, I'm like you, I'm just, I'm just, I just so curious about things. I just want to know, you know what, you know, I still may make a dumb decision, but, I just want to know why, why does that happen that way? 
Right well, now, I'm looking out. I'm looking out. Of, I'm, I'm, I'm headed to the airport. I just want to give you my visual right now. I'm looking sure. out right over the Charleston port. I can see the big boom cranes that offload the containers and everything. Super yeah. cool. There you go. All right. So the one thing that surprised me, I kept trying to figure out how are they really going to teach us economics in one lesson? But that's not really <laughs> the title. The, the title is kind of a play on words. It is. It's, it's interesting that he explains lots of different functions of economics with the same right. lesson. That that's what it means. There isn't yeah. one. I, I thought if it's only one lesson, this is going to be a really short book, but it's not a short book at all. No, uh, he takes one. I think concept what he does it, it, right and explains. He takes uh, every sort of as, yeah. He takes every yeah. aspect of what would infect an economy and explains it in like one short lesson. Right, and the lesson is pretty interesting. The lesson really is that. These he calls them economic fallacies that that these things we believe are true about economics. Um, he said they can all be um, explained through this idea of. How do I say this? It's so simple. I don't want to screw it up. Um, we have to look at not only the immediate effect of a of an economic policy, but the long term. And we have to look at its effect on the entire economy, not just one group of people. And that sounds That's so key, simple. Kevin. But you think, oh, come on, that can't possibly be what's happening. But every time he explains an economic policy, you look at it and go, yeah, that's exactly what's happening. All we did was look at the immediate effect on one group of people and said, oh, this must mm -hmm. be a good thing. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, if you if you think about, you know, like if, if you if you took like, let's say you had personal savings and you had ten thousand dollars in personal savings and uh, and that was your cash flow and you had debt of ten thousand dollars and you paid off your debt with that ten thousand, all that ten thousand dollars. You're like, man, that's fantastic. I'm out of debt. That's a great thing. Wow. I'll celebrate. Well, guess what you don't have now? You don't have money for cash flow. Right. <laughs> so you've got a real problem. So what happens is, is it's, it's the, it's what, what happens in like, in, in some, from, from some economist, economist standpoint is that they don't look at what, the, what is the alternate effect of that decision on a different people group or a different part of the economy. They just overlook it. They go, well, this is going to be a good thing for that group. And that's a good thing. Isn't it? That's a good thing. Everybody agrees. That's a good thing. Yeah, we should do this. And they don't go, wait a minute. That has a super negative effect on this other part, which everybody will pay for down the road. Everybody, not just the, pe the people that were affected or disaffected. Every single citizen of that economy will end up paying for it. And this is the, this is the struggle you run into. And this is why when you watch, when you watch like, like different um, Congress people, or, 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 you know, uh, representatives or even senators talk about things and they're just railing on one point. And you go, well, wait a minute, what about those people over there? That seems obvious. They say, well, not to them, it doesn't. So it's, it really is. It's an amazing sort of, I don't know, I almost feel like people lie to themselves on, this is going to be great, and they end up, it doesn't end up being great. It, it may help those people in the short term, but it does not help people, every, it, all people, and even the people that's intended to help in the long run. You, you know what? What I believe has happened is there are groups of people who have figured this out and used these principles to their advantage. And oh, for sure. that, that is what has screwed up most of our economy. You know what I got thinking about really, if you, if you read this and understand it, I would say the biggest lesson here is, is that we all should really be pulling for a much, much smaller government. I mean, that's the one oh, goodness. big lesson I get from this is all government spending is inefficient and unfair. Other than the ahead. basic constitutional points that our government was founded on, that, that our government is here for, for security, protection, um, police, fire, some really, really basic right. things. Right. And those will be inefficient spending as well, but we all agree that those are a good thing for a government to do. It creates a society where we can all succeed and prosper. 
But beyond the basic fundamental constitutional spending, all government spending is is inefficient and it should stop. Really? Wow. Well, our, our, the framers of our Constitution, let me tell you something. This is, I got to do something super cool, Kale. Super, super cool. Yeah. So this is what's about Charleston. It, you know, when we uh, had that little thing called the revolution. Yeah. <laughs> so we, there were, every state had to ratify the Constitution. So George Washington went to all 13 colonies and had them ratify the Constitution. So I got to stand in the room where the Constitution was ratified, and they had a they had a giant same size of the Constitution. You could sign it, and I'll send you the picture. Uh, you know, of course, you know it's just kind of fun, but yeah. you're like signing the Constitution as well, along with the other signers, which is which is super right. cool. Yeah, it is. but and so I'm sitting, I'm sitting there, I'm sitting there talking to this. There's there's this lady there with her two children, and I'm talking about the unique thing about our government and about freedom and why uh, the framers of our Constitution, why things are set certain ways. And one of the things that our framers of our constitution said is that the government, they warned us that the government should never be the largest in the nation. Many, many couple decades ago, our federal government became the largest employer in the nation. Yeah. And he, because they said at that, at that point, you will find manipulation of the, of the individual, of the citizen, to vote certain ways because of their job. Yes. And so that's why they said, that's why they said the last thing you want is for the federal government to get so big that it employs the most people. Because at that point you, you get things like socialism, communism, all the things that put government at the top. And the, you know, the old words of Ronald Reagan, the, the worst words you ever want to hear is we're, we're with the government. We're here to help. Yeah. Yeah. And, and- what we see <laughs> it, it, when you when you read this book and you just apply each chapter to the topic and you think, mm-hmm. how did we get this so wrong? And it's the same reason we got all of the health issues wrong. Um, unfortunately, sure. and I hate to say this, this is the downside of capitalism that we that doesn't seem to have been figured out by anybody yet. We realize capitalism raises everybody. Standard of living, America oh, was a wonderful sure experiment. Yeah. There's no doubt. Um, but we look at history and these, these and we, we got to kind of separate politics and, and economics somewhat. But we have a capitalistic economic society, supposedly. But we also have a, a republic and somehow it didn't work the way it was supposed to. It, the government got well, you, way yeah. too big, and we can trace almost all of our economic problems back to the government getting too big. Yeah, absolutely, you can. We're, we're uh, here's the thing, and this is why this is something really unique that I'd love for. I mean, this is what I, why I love trucking. One of the reasons why I love trucking is because it's an open market, and anybody can chase their dreams in it. Our country was founded on a representative republic that's based on two individuals. I know that sounds funny. Two individuals? What do you mean two individuals? <laughs> well, you have the individual you have the individual citizen has the right to pursue their life, the pursuit of happiness, or the pursuit of things, that we have the right to do that. The second individual is the state, the state that you live in, whether it's in, right. I'm in Alabama, you're out there in Oregon, you know, the state is an individual and it has rights too. This is right. why we this is why our Congress is set up the way it is. Most people don't know that. My super smart eighteen year old son educated me greatly on this. He's like, Dad, you don't know this? He goes, They should have taught you that in school. He yeah. goes, I learned that in school. <laughs> like, they should but it, and it's because those it, it's because that our representative republic was designed around two individuals right. that, that are given rights to pursue things individually by themselves and you cannot they're inalienable. That's what an inalienable right means it can't be taken away. Correct. And this is right. why we, we have we have we have the design of our government the way we do because it's the best for the people. It's the most prosperous. It's the most like inside of each person and I kinda got a little feeling that was walking around Charleston. Inside of every person is this because there was a lot of slavery in, in Charleston. Yeah. Charleston was the largest slave city in the United States. It's and so nobody looks back on slavery and goes, oh well, you know, there were some good. Th- no, They're slavery right. is just a bad period because human beings aren't designed ever to be enslaved. Right. And so, but the point being is, is this this individual right to go and pursue life because of the way in which we were created, and that's what that's what gives makes human beings 
pursue things and do great things and produce great things and start companies and employ people and help people change their lives because of the individual, not because of the state. This is why our government warns, don't let the government get so big that it's the largest employer because then it removes the power of the individual. Yeah. And that's a, that's a, that is so important. That's so, so important. Now, I'm, I want to let you know just real quick. I've got a few more minutes. And I, I just got to, I'm going to have to go to the airport and get through security, and I can jump right back on. Got it. So, right. uh, so, I, I, so but, but yeah. no, I, I love talking about this stuff because, man, this is, this is, I, t- I look at trucking and I go, huh, it is such a representative yeah. of why the framers yeah. of our Constitution did what they said. Yeah. Well, you know what else I got out of this book? The other big lesson, the first big lesson is our government is way too big, and that's a problem. And I've, I've always oh, yeah. believed yeah, yeah. that this give you, gives lots of evidence as to why that is true. But then the other thing I take from this book, the only way to increase wealth— uh, of of a human, of a company, of a nation, whatever. <laughs> Here it, it comes. Is. <laughs> I, yeah. Look, this this just justifies everything I've been doing my entire adult life. The only way to increase right. wealth yep. is to increase efficiency and production. You have that's to. The eat. only way. Yeah. That's it. You you can't. The government cannot create wealth. He gives great examples of government programs. That is the most inefficient way. We destroy wealth. When, when we give all of this wealth and power to the government, we're destroying it. The government is inefficient by design. We designed it that way with three different branches to fight amongst each other to make sure we get to the truth. But it, it's an inefficient system. Right. But it. it well, yeah. I'm, yep. It was OK being inefficient. It, that's because the government isn't supposed to do much. But now that we have the government's hands in everything. They are just very inefficient and they waste money. They have no incentive to be efficient. And I look at what this whole show is about and and what we talk about in business. And I don't focus on revenue hardly ever. We always focus on expenses. Mm -hmm. How can you produce what you produce more efficiently? And in trucking, what that means is how can you drive a mile less expensively? That, that's really what it comes down to in, in our world in trucking. How do we get the truck from point A to point B, the load, spending the least amount of money possible? That's the only way to increase wealth. Well, and, and yeah, and so I think about the ports, and this is what got me about the ports, which was um, one of the things in the contract was, that it was written a long time ago, which is they, they, they'll take this wage if they don't modernize, if they don't make yes. it, what did, you, what, did you, what did you just say? More efficient. Now, here's the thing. And, and so, and so that's, that's bad. Actually, that's bad for the ports. And when you're reading that book really about bad. production, when you, when you create more efficiency, production goes up, which what does that mean? You get to employ more people. Yes, wealth and goes up. more people are employed, more people are happy about it, right? Yeah, right. wealth goes up, which means more people buy stuff. More people are engaged in the economy. The whoever owns the port or owns whatever whatever product it is, it gets to increase their production. And what happens next? They employ more people. So hey. the union the union in a sense could get bigger because they'd have more people employed to the port. Here's a here's a great example that simplifies this so much. In fact, it simplifies it so much people are going to go, oh well, that's just stupid. No, it's not. This really tells you a, a lot about this concept. So. If we, he always talks about this myth of full employment. Oh, what a, what a joke that is. Do we want to 10 X the number of drivers we need in this country and have their wages go up? I could do that overnight. Really, really simple. We, we would need 10 times more drivers and, and all the cost of moving stuff, including wages for drivers would go up. And it's really easy. All we have to do is just outlaw any truck over a class four. <laughs> right? Oh, yeah, well, that, you'd have a lot more shipments. <laughs> that, that, that's how simple some of the concepts can be explained in this book, though. All we have right, to, if right. we want full employment in trucking and create huge amounts of jobs and raise wages, just eliminate all trucks over class four. Everything has to be moved in a class four vehicle or smaller. 
that seems vastly inefficient, though, Mr. Mr. That's, Mr. Rutherford. That's exactly <laughs> the problem. But but this is what government does. <laughs> government says, oh, look, we need more jobs. We'll create them. Government jobs created never increase wealth. They decrease wealth. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it, it's the same inefficient model that every time we lose efficiency, we lose wealth. Without a doubt, we do. Uh, hey, let me drop for just a minute. I got to get through security, then I'll jump right back on. All right. We'll, uh, we'll talk to you in just a minute. Let's, uh, let's find out what's going it. on on the phones. Matt. Welcome. Good, good morning, Kevin. Good morning. So I'm 70% of the way through the book. And when it's talking about tariffs and all that, yeah. which I don't disagree, and I think the book is correct, but I guess I'm on a totally different path when it comes to tariffs. I'm not against them. I know where you're going. But I'm like, Trump does it of picking certain products we put tariffs on. It, I think it, we it, should have some type of fair trade agreement. So just, for example, China, because they're our biggest trading partner, or yeah. at least importing anyway. If the trade balance is out by, say, 20%, and I don't know the math, I, you know, I don't know how to work this out, but let's just say we put a... 5% tariff on everything that comes from China. There, there'd have to be a formula so it automatically goes in place and it automatically goes away when trade comes back in balance. So the further out of balance it is, the higher the tariff goes. And it's on everything from China, not just steel, so, not just <coughs> one product or this, but every single thing. So this can get this. When they is, start buying more from us, right. the tariff goes away. So this can get really complicated, and this is why economics are such a mess and so hard to talk about. This book simplifies a lot of things about economics, but if you remember, he does it in almost every chapter at the beginning. He certainly did it with tariffs. He makes the statement that we're not going to talk about inflation right now. We're not going to talk about this right now. What he tries to make clear at the beginning of each um, chapter is that there are other reasons for tariffs or there are other reasons for these other policies that may have a purpose, but he's trying to keep it specifically to economics. And I, and I think that's a good idea. If you understand the economics first, then you'll have a better understanding of we might use a tariff to punish a company, our country. We do it all the time. When a country says we're, yep. we're embargoes, we embargo countries because they did something we don't like. Those are political reasons, not economic reasons, but they have an economic impact and we should be careful how we use those things. And, and tariffs, I had the exact same feeling when I was reading it that, well, wait a minute, it seems like tariffs might be necessary at times. But here's something else. We could confuse this even more. You're saying we have to have this balance between the United States and China. Well, the problem with that is what about Singapore? Maybe it's it's not a two way street. It, it's now we throw another country and it's a three way street. Maybe we have a deficit with Singapore with one product and a surplus with China with another. But between all three of us, there's actually balanced trade. Now you start thinking about the whole world and everybody we trade with. This could get really complicated. Well, yeah, and I certainly don't have the answer, but I, like you say, I, I'm against just doing it on individual products right. and the government just picking it. That's why my thought is, anyway, is it would just be some type of formula gets written and... I would say it should be like on a five-year running average. So it's not like we're changing tariffs every year. It's got to kind of be, you know, so there's no wild swings in it. where It, it adjusts every year, but it's on a five-year average of trade. So, so here, here's the one thing I always think about when I – and tariffs are one of the more complicated areas, I think. He, he explains in here – 
why on the surface, a tariff is no different than all of these other things. It will take away from wealth, not add to it. The problem is, again, we use tariffs for political reasons, not just economic reasons. And one of them that I completely agree with is what do you do when a country, when the government subsidizes the industry so that they're able to dump their products at a really cheap price into our market? That's when I think I I get it. Tariffs don't add to the wealth, but they can certainly help to try to balance some of this out if that's what's going on. We should not allow countries to subsidize an industry and then dump those products on us cheap. Well, yeah, so that's a step back before tariffs is, yeah, we got to do away with subsidies too. So right, right. That's, but, yeah, that's, we can't control other countries and what they subsidize, so that, that adds another complication to it. Yeah, that's why we might end up with tariffs when we're saying, wait a minute, tariffs are just bad. And they are. But no. you have to have completely equal trading partners and then we could do away with tariffs the other one that is so hard to get my head around still is inflation and he even says in the beginning he keeps saying look inflation will will screw this up it'll change the numbers but i'm not going to talk about inflation till later and then i get to where he talks about inflation and i still don't quite get it i i don't Would it have been possible? This is what I always wonder, because my whole life, inflation has just occurred. Every year, everything is more expensive. I mean, that's just the way it's been the whole time I've been on this planet. Is that necessary? Could could we have run an economic system where inflation wouldn't have happened? This is just my opinion, because I haven't got to that part in the book. Um. Inflation is necessary for governments to balance their books. Right. Right. In, 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 but for, it's, for a f- true economic survival and function, no. There, there, right. need, there doesn't need to be inflation. Right. That, that's, it, then why do we have such rampant inflation? We've had it my whole life. Here's the other thing that makes me crazy. The more of this stuff I learn... The more I wonder, how did we screw up so much? We've talked about our health system forever now. We are all in agreement that it's a mess. I don't think anybody disagrees with that anymore. How did we end up with such a horrible medical system? Seriously. And how did we get so many things wrong in economics? And if we could actually fix those two things, how much better would life be? Oh, yeah, Well, what was it, Mike Huckleby? And it, it's not, this isn't about economics and what you're talking about, but he wrote a book back when he was running for president, and don't remember the exact name of it. It's something about a simple a simple life or a simple government or something. And that kind of was the topic of the book, how much better life would be if everything was simple. And, yeah, you know, not having the government involved in every aspect of our life. Yeah, you wonder how much better things could be if we would have just gotten this right. And and what you find out, and this is not surprising, what you find out is this has always been kind of taken over by special interests. And when we talk about the swamp or the elites or the shadow government or or whatever we want to call it or refer to it, it starts to make sense that people who got to power used that power to, to create this system that benefits a very small group of people. Yeah. It's, and that's, well, like we've talked about with the fair tax. That's why we're such a fan of that is it takes power away. Right. And that's why it'll never get voted in by Congress. It'll have to get, come in you know, through the states. So who knows? Yeah. Here's the but book. I, I think. question for um, Brett when he comes back on, I don't need to be on the phone, but, um, about the whole FEMA load stuff. Yeah. I've got that on my list. I was going to ask him about that. Have you heard or found out anything more? No, I'm just wondering if the loads truly aren't even there. 
with all the stuff going on with FEMA and the way they're controlling things and the finances, because that's what I'm kind of oh. seeing is there just aren't that many loads. Oh, okay. It's nobody's so, paying the bill, so. <laughs> so what I did see on social media was that there has been a change, and again, this is third hand from social media, so I'm not trying to claim any of this is true. Um, that there has been a change, that these loads used to move through the load boards, and now their FEMA has created its own registration system for these loads. And they made it sound like they didn't tell anybody, and if you aren't already registered for 2024, it's too late. You could register for 2025 and then get on the list. That, but that's all third hand from social media. So I have no idea if any of it's true. Yeah, and I do know of this. I don't, I can't give any numbers, but I know over the last probably decade for sure, they've been investing in more warehousing and strategically around different areas of the country. So I think the pure volume of loads is going down because they have more warehouse stuff in certain regions of the country. Yeah. Yeah, well, they do have, you know, kind of some stockpile free storm, you know, stuff already ready. Well, and that would make sense. I mean, that just seems logical that that I mean, we know where the there's not much chance of a hurricane hitting Oregon. So are there other things that could no, hit and when one does, we got bigger problems. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So, yeah. you know, yeah, you got to worry about volcanoes. You know, here here we, yeah, we, we do possibly have to worry about there, volcanoes. Yeah. Um, earthquakes, yeah. we're but on the ring of fire. There, there's a lot on that end. Cause, yeah. You know, yeah, you when those happens, not much prep. No, no, that's for sure. Um, all right, I don't see, uh, I don't see Brent yet. Um, anything else on your mind today, Matt? No, other than, you know, this new hurricane coming in, and I'm headed to Florida. So I'm actually running ahead of schedule already, going to try to get down there and get everything on early, or depending upon what the storm shows by tomorrow afternoon, I might be sitting two days in Georgia, not even going in. Yeah, this was uh, so, before all the we'll climate. This one. Before all the climate, people start screaming that it's um, the worst hurricane season ever and look at how late it is and we're still having massive storms. This was a very, very quiet hurricane season. We had very few storms. Well, it, um, hurricane season doesn't end till mid-December, does it? Uh, it? It goes longer than most people or think. Or December? No, yeah. yeah, yeah. It, it goes pretty long into into fall. I, I don't know if it goes into winter officially or not. But it, And it usually gets pretty quiet at the end of the season. But this year, it's just a little different. But I follow a couple of those weather guys, and, and they go back and show that this whole idea that storms are getting bigger and more frequent, it's kind of like that things are getting hotter. None of it's true. The statistics are all there, and if you actually just look at them, none of that, that hyperbole about all these killer storms, it, it's not true. That Nothing's really changed. No, because they wasn't like one of the worst hurricanes ever in the 1800s. Uh, yeah. It, it, uh, 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 but obviously the damage to the human and correct. Um, it, material cost was less it, just because population was way less we had you know fewer the buildings wasn't there to right. destroy right we, yeah so that that's really the fact the, that this go ahead last one they're saying to be the most expensive well every time we have a bigger one it's, <laughs> it's going be to be more the most, expensive than last correct a because it, of inflation it, right a, because of there, more buildings more houses more roads i mean more everything more stuff to get destroyed that's exactly right yep that's and exactly right. Paul, Paul, if I have my chains on, yes, I do. Yeah. <laughs> Hurricane That's... season, oh, I don't carry it all the time. I, you know me, I'm I'm big into cutting wood and all that, and well, I eat everything with. And that's yeah, being I, prepared. <laughs> I got a saw. There you go. And, yep, a big. There's if there's trees in the road, I'm still getting through. That's right. <laughs> I love that. Good deal. 
All right, Matt, we'll uh, we'll let you go. We'll talk right. to you again soon. Let's go to Wisconsin. Rick, welcome. Good morning. I have a, a question about forecasting the market here. Uh, I'm coming up on uh, over nine years uh, being an owner-operator, signed on with, I won't say the company, but it starts with a schnein and ends with a dir. <laughs> um, okay. We, we've had... It had a really good time doing it. My wife quit her job so she could pick my loads for me. And now she has been so stressed in the last year and a half where we've had three years of no truck payments. I got 1.2 million on my truck now. And she is just so stressed trying to find loads that uh, spend so much time that I think we've decided to, to stop doing this. And, I, and, and I'm going to go back to being a company driver, I think. Um, it, it, it's just because there's a six month delay from if the market's going to turn, because Schneider has mainly contract freight that we see as it, it's a substantial amount of time before we actually see the rates that spot goes up and then the contracts got to get renegotiated. And, and, and from what I've seen in, in nine years with Schneider, it, there's a six month delay. So that means probably about another year, right? Before anything even gets better. Well, I, I, I try not to make predictions. I try to leave that to people that are a lot smarter than I am. And I'm not sure that, um, Anybody has a great track record at this and all of us, everybody I know is still sitting back, scratching their head saying, we don't know what to make of this economy. I I don't see anybody talking about 2025 as being some huge turnaround for trucking. I've I've heard some predictions that, yeah, sometime during 2025, it's going to get better. I still think the biggest problem is we are out of any kind of a clear pattern that we're used to. And we have a crazy election coming up that could change a lot of things. And and, and that's what I've always kind of been focused on is I'm not sure that we can predict where this market's going. I'm not even sure if we'll be able to after the election, but it's really difficult right now. But here's here's the thing I'll tell you, Rick, um, your decision and uh, to either get into business or get out of business, in my opinion, should never have to do with the economy or the economic cycle we're in. And I say that because, in my opinion, when you get into business, it, it should be long term. This is a huge commitment. It's a huge risk. It's a lot of work and it should be long term or not. But you should make this decision right now, not based on this economy and the fact that it's stressful to get freight, unless you're saying, I don't want to deal with this stress ever, that this isn't for me. And business is not for most people. That's the real truth of this. We call it the American dream, but it's honestly not for most people. Because you do, if you're going to run a business, you have to know how to run a business and be able to do it in the, the best times and the worst times. We're, we're in one of those bad times right now. Rates are down, volumes are down. So if you're making the decision on, well, I really want to be in business, but there's not enough money, then, then that's the wrong decision. If you're saying, look, we tried this business thing and it was okay when things were good, but it really sucks when things are bad. And I'd rather just not do this. Does, does that make sense that it, that it's really not about the numbers? It does make a lot of sense. It is about the stress and I'd rather quit now while I still have savings. Oh, that's, that, that's We've got about perfect. 30 K 30 K in the business and 10 K cash on hand at, you know, personal wise. And with the truck is still driving. It's not broke down. I don't want to like fix the truck. One more big, truck repairs and I got no savings then it breaks again and then I'm in debt and trying to stay in business I think I'd rather quit now and get the stress off my wife not saying that she won't I had to tell her you know maybe your next thing you're going to do is going to be just as stressful she says that's fine but it's different or she she knows she can't continue well look I I, (laughs) no I get it I've I know people who have very stressful jobs but for them when they leave the job they can turn it off you, you really can't do that with a business. I mean, you have to have that personality that you, you just realize you're, you're always in business and you don't ever really get to kind of turn it off. Now, if you're smart, you try to turn it off as much as possible and get away from it and get a break. But a lot of times you just can't. 
and and the the ironic part is when things are the worst, like when we're in an economy like this, that's when you really can't and shouldn't take a break from it. This is when you got to dig deep and say, I'm just going to push through. I'm going to do whatever I have to do to get through this horrible economy. And then we'll get back to when things are better. But I, I think the way you've handled this, I wish more people would. You tried business. You obviously did it right. You've been doing fine when the economy was fine. Now you're seeing the other side of business that it can get really difficult and stressful. And you're making the decision early enough that it's not a big deal. You learned a lesson. You still have money to get out of this correctly. Way too many people hold on until they destroy their finances. So, so I think the way you're handling this is very smart. Hey, Kevin. So I think. Yeah, go ahead. I'm Kevin. sorry. Go ahead. Hi, hey, Kevin. I'm back. I, I, I didn't catch the name. Caller, what, what's your uh, trucker? What's your name? Hey, Rick. This is Brent. <laughs> sorry, I had to get through, had to get through security at the airport. Uh, I get it. I, I heard you say that you were pulling freight for Schneider, and they're, they're a great company. Is that is that correct? You're pulling freight for them for off uh, yeah, predominantly dr- drive in for nine years. Okay, drive in. Have you thought about a different different type of freight? Have you thought about doing more flatbed or doing more uh, refrigerated or maybe specialized? And what, here's why I say this: is that you know mo- most owner operators. When they get in this business, they, they, they want to go after the highest paying freight. And certainly it, it takes a little bit more effort with certain other types of freight. But if you thought about it, maybe buy a different trailer and, and maybe get part of the market. And look, Schneider's a great company. I, I know them well. I've known they were one of the first companies I ever met when I started into trucking in 98. But, you know, they, they have to make a profit, too, on, on their freight. And so um, is there another are there other parts of the market you could look at? Because you know, driving in freight is, is the most ultra competitive freight in the market and because there because it's, the, it's there's more 80 percent of the freight out there is, is dry van that's why all these giant fleets uh, like the schneider go after that part because they can get a mass such a amount that they can they can drive their own efficiency to um to make a profit at it and so but it's tough but i get it and uh and i know i've, I've, I've never driven a truck I, I like to think i'm kind of a I'm trucker-esque but I did own a business, and I know what it's like to own a business. And Kevin's right, man. When you own a business, it's, it's, it never leaves you. You're just, you're just in it. And, but I was just thinking about what are, what are some of the other options for you that could pay you a better margin on things, uh, on, on, on the hauls that you're making? Because it's really about, about your return on the miles that you're running. And then, of course, managing your costs. It sounds like you're managing your costs really well. Uh, but uh, that'd just be my, my advice. I mean, there's, there's plenty of um, – there's plenty of freight in all kinds of segments out there. And, and talking about, and I'll finish on this, Rick, 2025, um, well, here's what I say to you. Went through this crazy market, in, which is great for the truckers and super happy, excited about it, uh, through the pandemic. And we came back down to normal. Uh, we've got lots of challenging things sort of in the economy. The inflation, it just kills people. Just to give you an idea, your money is worth 25% less today than it was three years ago. And that's a, that's a, that's a lot of... <laughs> A lot of value in money, and that's, that's mine too. You know, mine too. I, I got, I got five kids, man. I know what it's, I know what it's like, and so that's a big part of it. And so when Kevin says we just need to get through this economy, that's part of it. Um, so, so that would be my. So about 2025, what we're gonna, what you're gonna see is we're right at the end of two years of a normal cycle, and so, and and usually it takes about 10 percent longer than the cycle, the bit, the good cycle you were in for it to work out on the bottom end and 2025 is not going to be a banner year. It doesn't mean it's not going to be a, a, a good enough year now because rates, the spot market rates will continue to come back up and they have, they have year over year and not, they're not great, but they've come back, they've come up year over year because they can't, here's the thing. They can't sustain at this for much longer because the things you're, you're saying right now, which is it's, it's marginal and drive and freight. And by the way, here's the other secret. The big contract haulers, the Schneiders, the Swifts, the, all the big ones out there, they're going to push back this year because they had their rates depressed really hard so all throughout this year. They're going to push back, and their rates are going to go up next year between 3 and 5% because they have to do it. And here's the thing. The, the shipper relies on these contract, these big contract haulers. I mean, they rely on them. So they're, they're going to allow that 3 to 5% increase, which will bring spot rates back up, should bring spot rates back up to a more – 
maybe digestible form or a digestible amount. So I just kind of leave you with that. And uh, if anything we can do to help you, man, gosh, we're all in it for you. No problem. Uh, but, um, you know, sounds like you got your head screwed on straight, straight, especially with your wife looking. I know mine keeps mine screwed on straight pretty, <laughs> pretty straight. So that's a good thing. I have. A hazmat endorsement and tanker endorsement oh. for all the 10 okay. years I've been with Schneider. And I okay. haven't had much to use for that. Uh, a couple times a year, I get some totes that need the tanker endorsement in the, in the trailer four and, and a couple of hazmat loads here and there. But I'm thinking about doing dry. I don't want to do chemical, but dry tanker stuff, sand or, you okay. know, uh, yeah. melanite, yeah. stuff like that. For And be a company driver. I, my, we, we really got to. Uh, it was it, like Kevin says, we, I'm glad we did this and, uh, we yeah. learned a lot, 10 years, another eight years, I'll be 66. And I don't know that I, I yeah. want to really be driving much. I'm kind of in the ramping it down section yeah. of my life. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to put up with any more of that really high stress like that, that we're putting on ourselves. <laughs> I understand. Other people yeah. are putting, if we got something to blame yeah. for it, that's better than, than just, oh, well, that's because we're in business. This is what we got to do. Yeah. No, <laughs> I think, I, I think we're going to get out, yeah. get out of I, it. And I got to figure out what to do with I the understand. truck and. And, sure. and all that. So the but the, the way to market, uh, too much stress. Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll I got you. I'll have to give you the bad news. There, there's never a good way out of a used truck, and unfortunately, we're in a really depressed market for truck prices right now. You're not going to get much for this thing, um, and that's just the way it is. And there aren't many ways around it, and it's also difficult to sell a truck on the open market unless you've got somebody with cash. Finance companies won't right. touch these kind of deals. So I think I'll just keep it and then turn it into a toy hauler. That's not a bad idea. I, I was going to recommend if, I mean, if, if you could afford to keep it, you might be better off. If you can afford to keep it and turn it into something useful, that's even better. But sometimes when the prices are this low, um, you'd be better off sitting on it maybe some opportunity comes up later or maybe the market turns around. You might be able to sell it for a little more. Usually not. Uh, there's usually no good way out of this. That, that's why I say the bad news is getting rid of a used truck is usually um, <clears throat> not very profitable and not very easy. I can park it on my son's property under some tree kind of area, but I, I suppose tarp it and put the uh, comprehensive insurance on it and, yeah, and just wait a yeah. wait a couple of years. Maybe prices will go back up on used trucks. Maybe I will be able to get rid of it then. But it, it, it's always <sighs> possible. So if you don't have to get rid of it right now, sometimes it's better just not to. That, that, that's a good call. I think now should I park it with full tanks of fuel and death or yeah, yeah, or, and, or, and or, or, or yeah, fill everything up and drop in some uh, the stable the the fuel stabilizer. And you should be okay. And, I got. And the other thing you want to do once in a while, you, you don't have to be you know crazy about doing it on the third of every month, but you should start and run this truck occasionally. And and really, the biggest reason, honestly, is to eventually just run the fuel out of it and put some fresh fuel in. Okay, and uh, just I, idling, it's fine. I don't need to run it down the road, or. Well, you can, except it takes an awful long time to go through fuel just idling. And idling is really hard on the truck and the emissions. So I, I would say once in a while, um, maybe just take it and drive it enough that you got to put some fresh fuel in there. I'll have to look in what it costs to even get a plate and, an, and insurance to, so I could even just take it down the road. Yeah, that's true, too. So, so sometimes you look at all these other factors and you go, well, I can either let it sit there and know that after a year, the fuel's going to get pretty stale. Most things on, on a truck that sit are not a problem anymore. I, I've talked about this. You can let a truck sit for 10 years and very few things deteriorate the way they used to. Hoses, seals, all that stuff, the, the, the materials are way better. Very little deteriorates on a on a truck or a vehicle that sits. The one thing I worry about is the fuel. Is fuel stabilizer for diesel different than gas? Um, the Stable makes a product for diesel, yes. Do not use the same product as, okay. as gas. It will be designated for diesel. Or it, they may have a multi-use product, but you want it to say diesel somewhere on the bottle that it that it's a diesel conditioner. If it's both, and I don't even know if that exists. It's okay, 
but make sure that it's it's made for diesel. Roger, thank you. Yeah, it's we've been blessed with thirty five hundred net a week for nine years, and then the well, last a, year and a half, it's it's a lot less. You've, you've had a good run. You know, most businesses don't make it past five. We even stopped our simple contributions this year so we could keep our cash and our savings accounts. Yeah. And, you, uh, and that, well, now, now we're going out of business, not not uh, having revenue come in. We have to, to stop the simple altogether. Yeah. Hey, hey, you've, you've done all the right things, and I think it is time you've come to the place where I, I think it makes sense for you um, to do what you're doing. I, I, I think you've done a lot of things right, and you'll be able to get out of this without any real downside, and you had a good 10-year run. Appreciate it. Hey, you're the best too. You know that? Well, thank <laughs> you. Have good you. advice. Too. Thanks. <laughs> hey, that's the reason I, I did a lot of my decision making is listen to your show. So, well, thanks. I thanks. appreciate your, your show a lot. And Brett, I like that. I like your contributions too. It's been nice. Oh, thanks, Rick. Thanks, Rick. Well, the industry's better with you. Sorry. I mean, look, life, life moves forward, and sometimes you got to make those hard decisions. And to hear Kevin say, uh, to give his advice on it is uh, makes me feel more comfortable that that uh, you've made you made the right decisions. And look, exiting something well is as hard as getting that's, into something. That's else. exactly right. And so it's tough, man. So so it's so true. Look, I, I had to exit a business when I was 25 years old, and fortunately, we were able to pay off the creditors uh, to their satisfaction, and and I didn't bankrupt. But boy, there's not any part of it that, that I go, God, man, I wish I could have stuck around. But you know. That's what led me to trucking, and I'm super excited that I ended up in trucking because, man, this is the industry that I love. It has taken me a good six months to really have it set in that I'm going to stop being self-employed. I'm going to – I couldn't well, I couldn't see a way to adjust good. to stay self-employed in, in the industry with with uh, the considerations of all the stress of my wife and the rest of my life. Uh, the fourth grandbaby is coming along. I'm going to have more home time in my next venture. So There you go. Uh, that's – now, you know, you, you've thought this through, balance. You, you've done it right, you've taken your time, you thought about it, I, I think you're making a good decision. Yeah, it was hard, but it was. Well, it yeah. took me a long time to fight that. Oh, I want to stay in business, I want to stay I'll in business. <laughs> no, I know. Go, go, uh, en- go enjoy the last, uh, you know, whatever you got, five or maybe ten years in the industry, enjoy your family, enjoy the grandkids. Yeah. Uh, it's a good time to, to get out based on where you are. It's also, you know, Brent, I want to say it's a good time to get in, but this yep. uh, this election still has me a little worried. But that's not going to be long. What are we down to, 30 days now, Les? Yeah, yeah. not long. Yeah. Not long at all. i tell you what. It's, uh, hey, it's, it's the thing I do appreciate about Rick, though, is he's taking his time about making that decision to exit. And um, super, super important that you take your time to do anything because, Closing out something right is really important because uh, it helps you with what you're going to do next, with whatever you're going to do next, and that's super important. But, I, look, you, Rick, you'll never hear me argue with anyone about margin for, you know, for their life, but it creates more opportunity to be with their family, especially their grandkids, which uh, yeah, that's eternity walking across the floor every day for you to stare at and, and, and enjoy. So you, you won't, y'all won't argue with you on that one, buddy. You know, Brent, if, if we look, last week the um – the contract rates came out and the contract rates right now, the average contract rate is less than the average cost of operating a truck for a big fleet. The the big fleets have to be losing money on a lot of their freight right now. Well, let me, let me just say this to you because I heard this, they, they signaled this and this is for every owner operator out there. They signaled this at the beginning of the year, two of the largest, haulers in America signaled that the, the, the margin that they were making on contract freight, and the contract freight is one way long haul freight. All right. So that's spot market freight because 90% of spot market freight is one way long haul. So they signaled, now look for, for all of 2023, they enjoyed like 10, 12%, 14% above the market, above, right. above market. Now right. I'm not saying uh, that's above trend. In other words, they were, they were doing really well in their contract break. That's why the spot market went to where it went so quickly, because all the contract haulers weren't turning down any freight. They were just taking all the freight because they were doing fine on it. So they signaled at the beginning of this year that they were not going to haul as much one-way long haul, and they were going to shift some of their contract trucks 
into the dedicated marketplace. And I've got a great slide on. I'll send it over to you. That sh- it, sh- it shows the, tran- the transfer of one-way long haul into dedicated because they can make more return on their dedicated trucks than they can on their one-way contract trucks because the marketplace. And here's what they're doing. Most all these large contract haulers have very successful brokerage arms, and they're pushing that freight into their brokerage arm because they can get a truck at a lot less than market, 10, yeah. 15, almost 20% below market. And that's the, that's the spot market, everybody. That's the spot market. And so that's why, that's why you're seeing the prices kind of like shift around some because more freight's coming in here. Because right now, they can, you know, look, big companies work, they work month to month, quarter to quarter. They don't think long term. They think because they have to think quarter to quarter because that's the way their investors and the way the or their the, the publicly traded. That's the way that they're evaluated. So if they if they can do something that can shift and they can get two, three, four, five percent more in a quarter, that's huge for them. And that's is why this is why this transition is going on, moving the contract trucks to dedicated and then taking some of the contract breaks that they're getting because the shippers still trust them to move it and they they're comfortable with the spot market. Well, they're fine as long as you're responsible for it, move it any way you want to. So the, the, the spot market, the freight, is getting more freight in it. And this is why you see the outbound tender reject things that's on sonar staying at about right near 5%, which is the industry average. So this is why, this is why rate, rates have continued to edge up just a little bit over last year. It's because more contract freight is coming into the spot market. This is why I'm, I'm, I'm maybe a little more hopeful than not hopeful on the rates beginning to move up very slow. They're going to move up slowly. But they're going to continue to move up because they just—it's not—it's not sustainable for the spot market either. The rate that it's going. Yeah, we're uh, we're certainly kind of lingering at the bottom, uh, and this was the one thing we talked about. We we knew we were kind of at the bottom, although rates dropped a little bit. The the contract rates did, but. Um, there's no doubt it is a very tough environment when rates drop below um, the cost of operating the truck for those fleets. Um, I'm also working with a, um, in my coaching program, I'm working with a family business that has been around for decades, a uh, family trucking company, and they're circling the bowl. Um and, and it's been frustrating because I've been working with, it's a family run business. I've been working with one person uh, and the rest of the family just doesn't want to see that the industry has changed. This is a company that has been very profitable for decades, supported several families, and it's been coming apart um, since this market started to tank and we've been trying to put things in place and they just won't change. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it now. We're, I, I told them on the last call, we're, wow. down to, we're down to weeks. If they don't make the changes, oh, wow. Wow. We're, we're really down to weeks. And it's just sad to see this. Wow. Well, it really is. I'll tell you what, the thing, I learned this when, when Truck Stop was growing as a, as a platform. We, we, we grew the company four times its size in, in six years. And so I learned this really quick. Because, I, I, you know, there's a, there's a reason why people that, that are like bankers, that's why they have money. It's because they're always focused on, what does money do? And so I asked him, I asked every one of them, I said, what's, what's the most important thing when you're, when you're growing a business? And I'm telling you, it's nine, Kevin, nine out of 10 of them said the same thing. They said, pivot off a bad idea as fast as possible. In oh, other yeah. words, when the market changes, change with it. If not, you're going to, you're going to die a slow death. Yeah. And it's just, because they're like, look, look, if you, if you, if you're smart and you want to get business, the key to success is pivoting. It's not like, oh, well, I, I'll do it if I have to. No, no, no. It's to look what's coming at me and then pivot and go, okay, I'm going to pivot here and I'll gain 10%. I'm going to pivot yeah. here. I'm going to gain 8%. I'm going to pivot here. I'm going to get 7 more percent. Because the pivot is the most important thing because it keeps you out of a bad decision. It, it, it takes you out of a bad decision quicker. And it's not a bad decision. It's just the market changed. Every business changes. Right. I mean, my goodness, right. 2008, 2008, I was in the media world. Yeah, well, that's when the that's when the, the housing market went crazy. We went from we went from we were projecting a thirty percent growth. Our company, because I work for Overdrive Magazine, remember we had a thirty percent decrease. Yeah. We had a sixty percent change in potential revenue. Talk about hard. Yeah, that's we big. better pivot quickly or we'll lose the company. Yep, that, that's Super big. important. Yeah, no doubt. Hey, you know, um, we got a call coming yeah, in. What? How are you doing on time? All right. You got to go here anytime. 
Oh, yeah. Uh, no, I got, I got about 10 minutes. I'm good. Okay. What, one other thing I just, I was just looking at my notes from the book, and I haven't finished it yet, but I'm about three quarters of the way through it. <laughs> yeah. One of the other things I, I, if we could figure out how to get people to shift their thought process on this, and this is hard for me to say because I'm a numbers guy, and I talk about the numbers right. all the time. Right. One of the things, that, and I don't even remember what the sentence was in the book, but it was this idea that money itself, the, the money is not the wealth. The, but we focus oh, so no. much on the, the money, and this is, I, I asked the question while you were going through security, Matt and I were talking, and I said the one concept I can't get my head around in this book is, could you run a country and an economy without inflation? This book makes it sound like you could, but has anybody ever tried it? It doesn't seem like it ever happened. Well, inflation is completely government. Right. Government influence. It's not. I mean, that's where they're, they take more money from the people. And they just, so yeah. it's. It, it, you, you could, but here, the, the struggle is that many people think that the government is the answer. Like, for instance, in the Great Depression, uh, way back in before I was ever born, you know, they say that if the government would have stayed out of the Depression, we would have gotten out of the Depression, out of the Depression if you just let the economy correct itself. And people fail, and businesses fail. But sometimes they say, oh, everything's too big to fail, too big to fail. So they would have let them stay out of the economy. We would have been out of the Great Depression two and a half years earlier. So here, here's what I wonder. Now that, uh, so, yeah, so, yeah. so I'll, I'll go back. When my parents bought the house I grew up in, they bought it in the early 60s. It was a 1,200 square foot split level in, in a suburb with a little bit of land. They paid $25,000 for that house. Is there a way that we could have run our economy that that same comparable house would still be $25,000 today? Well, um, possibly. I mean, just depends on I, part of it's supply and demand. Like, for instance, you know, beachfront property is not the same as, you know. Correct, right. In, right. Inland and property, that's why but, I said a, a but, comparable I mean, yeah. property. Right. It, because the only reason yeah. it yeah. costs more is because of inflation. And the book makes it sound like right. you could run an economy without inflation. But nobody ever has that. Well, aware. You have, well yeah, here's the problem, Kevin. We humans don't like pain. We just don't like it, and right. we're going to run from it. And so the thing is, is that if you're if you're willing, it's kind of like it's kind of like raising kids. If you're willing to let your kid go through some pain, oh, they're yeah. going to learn things a whole lot. Oh, no they're doubt. going to learn, learn things a whole lot faster. No doubt. A whole lot faster. But most parents, most parents will all we are all afraid of our children going through pain, and so we like ah, uh, you know, we we give them quick advice, or or we we correct things, and we don't let them suffer. And, you know, not, I don't mean suffer like it's going to kill them. I just mean right. suffer like, oh, they're right. going to go through something hard. And then, but when we go through things hard, here's the thing. The time frame lasts, lo- less, it lasts a whole lot less. And, and when there's less, there's a more opportunity to come out of it and do well. So it's really about just w- the willingness to want to go through pain. And that's business and that's life. And that's, that's, those that face things quicker get out of the situation quicker and they enjoy life more. Well, you, you know, know we, you got to be willing to, gotta be willing to address the pain. We just had a great example of that. The guy who's going to get out of business after 10 yeah. years, but he's doing yeah, it Rick, right. Rick, Rick, yeah. He, Rick. He's, he's facing it. He's making the decision and then he's taking action. Oh, he's for being sure. very proactive. And that's what I normally don't see. What I see is people in his right. position will just struggle month after month after month trying right. to save right. it. And the pain goes on much longer, and it's usually much worse. He's doing it right. He won't have to suffer any real financial consequences from this. He's got cash. He can hold on to the truck. He's not behind on his taxes. He's exiting at the right time, and that's pretty rare. Right. He's pivoting pivoting wisely. Yeah. That's the thing. I'm just uh, that word. uh, If I can tell that to any trucker that, you know, out there listening to you, just learn how to pivot quickly and pivot wisely and man life is just so much more you won't always be you won't always like the decision because man not, nobody likes to give up you know like, man I, you, one of the things that my dad always said that you, you can't beat a person that won't give up you, but sometimes it's not giving up it's just pivoting to what's next 
You and know, so one that's of the, super important to keep that in your mind. One of the hardest decisions I've made in my life, and I remember thinking back, it, I, I make decisions usually very quickly. I, I've talked about this, just my personality. Right. Um, here's a goofy example. If I go to a new restaurant and I open the menu, the very first dish I see that sounds good, I just order it. I don't look at the rest of the menu. I mean, that, that's, that's I'm the same way. <laughs> same way. Same way. <laughs> People look at me and go, you didn't get past the first page. I know. I found something I want already. Why would I keep reading? Didn't, didn't need to. <laughs> right. I, I, no, this one sounds great. I'm going to try it. So I make decisions yep. quickly. I, I've talked about testing. For whatever reason, I test really well. And I am almost always the first one done in a room taking a test. Almost always. I, I don't think I've, there's ever been a time when I wasn't in the top three of being done first. Because for me, I'd look at a question, I either know it or I don't. And, and thinking it through usually isn't going to help me much. So I, I make decisions um, usually pretty quickly. But the hardest decision I've made that I can remember um, was the decision to sell my trucking company. That was not an easy one. Brent, did we I lose you? I can totally understand. Man. I mean, well, no, 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 I'm here. Yeah. Just, uh, I was just thinking about what you just said. I mean, it's, it, 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 look, I mean, I had to close my business too, and it was painful, and I didn't like it, and, and uh, felt like I was giving up. And, but once I had made the decision up, I moved quickly to yeah. do everything I could to close it with honor and character and where I still had relationships with the people that I had done business with. And look, they didn't like getting, I, tried, I, I paid everybody about 75 cents on the dollar of what I owed them, which was, they were happy to, by the way, I was amazed. They were happy to get it. They were like, Oh, really? You're not like going to like just not pay us at all. I'm like, no, 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 this is what I can do. And yeah, they're right. like, we'll take it. We'll close it out. If you'll pay us, we'll take it. No, nope. thank you so much for, te- for telling us, you know? Yeah. And um, so, you know, but, and look, I, I still look back on it and go, God, wait, man, I should have done more homework. I should have done better. I should have done this. And that's okay. That's okay. But I still, you know what? All those people I did business with, I still have those relationships. I still, well, I'm still friends with most all of them that, that uh, I did business with. This is in my 20s. Yeah. You know, so this yeah. a few decades ago. <laughs> so, so it's super important to, to always do it with character. Uh-oh. Brent, and that's why you oh, want to do there it. you are. You're, You're back. It. Hey, I just, uh, Angie's getting yeah. questions. Um, people want to know what book okay. we're talking about. Oh, yeah. Want to give well, it to them? Economics in One Lesson by Henry. Yeah, Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt. Now, H-A-Z-L-E-T-T. It's kind of an interesting, interesting name. To, that's why you can look it up. Yeah, it is. Um, I will say this. This is not one of those easy reading, feel good books. It is an economics no, no, no. book, <laughs> and, and you. In fact, I'm glad I'm reading it and not listening to it. Now I know for a lot of our listeners, yeah, listening yeah. is much much better. And if I were traveling right now, I would listen to this book, but I would want to right. read. This would be the one that I would get the printed book and the audio if I'm going to be traveling, because I want the yeah, printed book. Yeah, I mean, listen and read it. Yeah. Yeah. So, because it there, there's. It is a fairly simple concept, but then it gets applied to very complicated things. Our economy is very complicated. Right. This, this idea, you oh, know, and, sure. and, and the main premise of the book, you look at it and go, well, duh, uh, of course, that's how we should look at this, except we don't. We don't ever look at anything this way, but it seems so obvious. Of course, the lesson of the book is, you can't look at just the short-term consequences of an economic policy. You have to look at the long-term consequences. And you can't just look at one group. You have to look at how it affects the entire economy. That is the one lesson of this book, right? Absolutely. You have it's to look just at applied. how it affects every single piece of it. Just like, like and that's what that's like. I mean, right. You know, you're gonna make a change in your engine. If you're gonna make a change in your engine, you need to understand how it affects your drive train. Yeah, and and <laughs> so, so no, that's a great example. People will understand. And also, yeah. I, I could put nitrous oxide into the fuel stream, and boy, will it run really right. good, but only short term. 
You'll destroy the engine doing that. Yes, it will perform yeah. incredibly yeah. well for a very short period of time, but you can't sustain right. that. So, so it's the same thing again. We can't just look at the effects of this policy short term. We yeah. have to know what's going to happen in the long term. And and it turns out we we just don't get any of this stuff right. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, Kevin. I'm trying to get. I'm, I'm trying to get up. I'm checking in on my flight. But um, yeah, so it, 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 understanding the consequences in anything that you do in life is so important. I mean, look, I, I'm all for a lot of things, and sometimes I don't make it all the way through. But uh, the times that I do, and usually, I, you know, and, and what I'll say, if you're thinking it all the way through, it never hurts to get good counsel. This is why I love the truckers that call into your program. They're asking for your counsel. So when you get good counsel for things, you're able to like be patient with your decision. Listen to all the potential outcomes, and then, and then you can kind of make a, you know, what I like to call a, a, a wisdom decision, where you like pulling, pull, okay, well, given what these other people that I trust say about this, how, how, what kind of decision do I need to make now? So that's kind of, you know, look, I trust myself, no doubt, you should, you should, you know, but you always want to bring wise counsel into it when you're, when you're, when you're trying to make a decision on something, because then you can make. What usually is the best, most most rounded decision for yourself, and then you kind of go, okay, well, I've, I've considered as many things as possible. So you know, it ends up me, working out much better for you. I know you've got to run. Let me leave you with this one one lesson from this yeah, book. Man. So you'll remember this: the the broken window fallacy. Oh, that's a great one. And <laughs> think about it starts off with a broken window. Yeah, that's such a great one. Yeah. Think about the timing of this. Wait till you hear the last sentence in this paragraph. So here's the explanation of the broken window fallacy. One of the most famous illustrations from the book is the parable of the broken window, which explains that destruction, like breaking a window, doesn't lead to economic benefit because it diverts resources from other potential uses. So here's the argument. That if a child throws a rock through a window, he just stimulated the economy because now somebody has a job to go do that they can get paid for. And on the surface, you think, oh, well, well, that makes sense. Except then why don't we all just walk around breaking windows all day? (laughs) Right. I mean, if this if this would be good for our economy, then we should all just break all of the windows in our house. We look at all the it's kind of like saying all we have to do to stimulate the trucking industry is outlaw big trucks. It, it, none of this makes sense, but listen to this word, the final sentence in this, this challenges the notion that war or disasters can stimulate the economy. What have we all been talking about? Oh, look, all the activity from the war. Oh, look, we have another storm coming. Look at all the loads we're going to have. We talk about storms all the time in trucking as though it's a good thing. Well, once again, you're going to look at one side of the equation. It's good for the truckers that can haul some of the FEMA loads, and that's, right. that gives you more revenue. But when when, a, when an entire part of the country loses multiple billions of dollars, that's, that's, that's not good for the overall economy. So you pay for it down the road. Right. And that that really yeah. is the lesson in here, that even these things that look good on the surface are really bad for the economy overall. But but he does point out many times these situations will lead to a benefit for a group. It, the other one are unions. Yes, unions benefit their members, but they're horrible for our economy. Well, I agree. Yeah, it, it's uh, it's because it doesn't create a free free market in, in any way, and that's, it's that's very the issue. Inefficient. When you don't have a free market, when you have a free market, it doesn't it doesn't work ever. And so, uh, this is why uh, they're challenges. And in this last strike, the biggest sticking point seems to be that the union doesn't want anything modernized. And what does that do to production and its production right. that creates wealth? I mean, we have it totally backwards, but the, yeah, yeah. But the union members yeah. do benefit from this. It's the rest of us that get screwed. For sure they do. For sure they do. And I don't want to be against them at all. I'm just saying you got to look at the overall set for that thing. Yeah. So, hey, Kevin, one, one quick thing I want to point yeah. out, one quick point out before I have to go is that, that like, for instance, um, last week, uh, I just looked at the numbers for last week in the marketplace, and boy, we had a, we had a pretty significant increase in, in rates. They went up uh, quite a bit. They went up um, over 20 cents in the overall marketplace. And you had BAM went up, flatbed went up, refrigerated went up. They all three went up uh, quite a bit. BAM, BAM was up 
uh, seven cents. Flat bed was up ten cents, and refrigerated was up uh, looks like uh, eight cents. My point about this is that is that you know when there was a signal that the strike was going to cause problems, and you, you already knew that Helene caused some problems, and that's just in the geographic area, uh, and not problems. It was going to make rates go up because freight whenever freight is constrained, um, rate rates go up, and so. Um, I say this because we, we were talking about planning for your business. Look, if you're a trucker out there, read the news. You know what's coming at you. If you if you if you know there's some the challenges in the market, you should be able to get better rates on things. Just for maybe it's, if it, if it's just for that week or that 10 days or that 14 days where marketplaces. Because remember, as you and I've said over and over and over, it's the supply and demand marketplace, and the stress on the economy puts stress in different areas. And stress means usually rates will go up. So. It's really, it was really it's kind of, kind of a, 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 I wouldn't say it's like encouraging. It's just something to watch when you, when you know there's going to be uncertainty and, and or any chaos in a, in a marketplace's biggest rate, rate rates should go up. So you should be able to negotiate a better rate. If you're not, then you just missed it. So I would just say pay attention to the overall, the data's out there. We publish it for free. Every week, a thing called the Spot Market Insights. We're happy to give it to any trucker. If they want to reach out to TruckStop or just at truckstop.com to get it, we'll, we'll, we'll email it to you every week where you see what's happening in the market. Excellent. All right, Brent, I know you got to get yeah, on a, an yeah. airplane again and get some more miles under your belt, <laughs> so we'll do. let you go. <laughs> All right, buddy. Well, great being on today. Thanks for what you're doing to help the truckers. and. Happy to be your partner anytime. All right. Good talking to you. Take care. We'll talk to you again next week. Let's go back to the phones. Let's go to Ohio. Herschel, welcome. Hey, Kevin. What's on your mind today? You there? Yeah. Well, I I called the Party of Miracle just for kicks and grins, and they told me, because I wanted to know, that that stick, that single-serve stick, you know, the little packet, yeah. is too of the new style scoop. Got it. Okay. It is too. Okay. So you, you've got the a, other one. A, a baseline. Like I say, I, you know, I go back and forth. I've got one tumbler that's 40 ounce. I've got one that's 30 ounce. I, I put about a scoop and a half in either one. The old style big scoop. I've got a bunch of those around. I, I put about one and a half in those and it works out just fine. I, I don't even know what that is as far as I think it's a serving and a half of the old scoop. Oh, okay. And I remember what I wanted to ask you Friday or Thursday, whatever day that was. Now I know what it was. David Owen from Nastic. Yeah. He talk about doing a podcast with him, but I must be missing it. Where is this podcast? I think he's an interesting guy. I'd like to listen to it just because I think David Owen's an interesting guy. He is, and I, I love the way we do the podcast. So David is the last person on earth that does not have a cell phone or a computer. And that is the truth. He does not yeah, have a cell phone yep. or a computer. When he gets an email, his assistant prints out the email and puts it in his inbox. He reads the email writes his answer on the paper and gives it back to her and she emails somebody the answer. So when we do a podcast, all he does is pick up his office phone and call me. And he, I answer the phone and we start talking and one of his tech guys in the background has hit record. And, and that's it. We, we just talk. It'd be just like if he called me on any given day and we just started talking, which is what we do. Um, right now that podcast is only available to their members. We, um, David, I kind of figured that's what it was, but yeah. I never heard you say David does want it to go out to our tribe. So we are working on getting those episodes on our app. So eventually you will be able to go back and listen to them all. I'm pretty sure we, we will have access to all of them and we'll put them up there. I know Aaron's working on it. Okay. Right. That's what I was curious about. I thought, I hear you talking about it, but you never say where we can hear it. So Yeah, that's know. why. Should should be on the app sometime soon. Okay. Good enough. Thank you, Kevin. You're welcome. Thanks for the call. All right, let's go to New Jersey. Danny, welcome. <laughs> Good morning, Kevin. How you doing? Good. What's on your uh, mind today? I, I, I got a lot on my mind, Kevin. <laughs> you know, especially, I mean, you... 
stimulate. And uh, and I, I think you can identify with this when you used to listen to Bruce Williams. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, just the ability to think about things. But I, I, I got... I, I got what I believe is a little insight into things like I, I, I have a personal friend who works on the pier and uh, over here in North in you know, in New Jersey, Port Elizabeth. And by trade, he's a mechanic. And I, I just want to give a brief background about sure. him. Could I do that? Yeah, go ahead. Because I, 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 I get into the weeds by and the, how I found him. Uh, my 2003 Coronado, I had an issue with the optimum idle, and he wasn't able to fix it. And he's the type of guy where he went home that night and he got every book online that he could to figure out, you know, to read about it and everything. And he he, he wound up fixing it for me. But um, he was attached, I, like I called on Wednesday with Dr. Tracy. I, I maneuvered over here all of my career through the union power that was here. And he is attached to the unions here, the Teamsters. So he was brought in to the organization that I work for. And just to, and I'm going to brag about myself a little bit right now. He was getting really good work. It was delivering food to the supermarkets. And he would put, they would give us directions on how to get to the first stop. And then we had to find out how to get from store to store after that. And I would give him directions, but he never trusted me. He'd always put the store into the GPS and I would beat the GPS all the time. And I attribute that because I use nothing but maps. You know, I, I got more than a thousand dollars worth of maps. And back when I started in 1975, if I was going, you know, to Boston or if I was going something like there, I would call the police department and I would say, listen, I'm coming into this certain location. I would talk to the, to the front desk, you know, the desk sergeant, and he would give me directions on how to get to the location where I had to go. But I, I just want to, like what we were talking about earlier on, you, you were talking about the, the economy book, and then you kind of dovetailed off to the, to the other book that I, I don't remember you saying, on how they're able to create chaos, and then they come in and they control the chaos. That's in a book written by... Um, Oh, man, don't let me forget it now. Hegel is his last name. Uh, Frederick Hegel out of Germany. This is where uh, Marx and uh, what you call it? And uh, Engels studied under, under him, and that's where the Communist Manifest. But I just that that's what we're experiencing right now within our government, because our government is so big that. And we've been, like I kind of dovetailed into this on Wednesday, we've been pummeled to, that, to be group think. You know what I mean? Like I always stood, uh, like I was saying, as, as an individual, the company that I decided to lease my truck with is, wasn't a company, it was a family-owned co-op, but they were unionized. I had to pay union dues, $125 every month. I was required to carry five million dollars worth of insurance, which technically the average I mean there were 120 owner operators that worked there. And they didn't realize that we're paying for the whole fleet. You know, we're paying for all the company trucks and everything. But right. this is the decision consciously that I made. But I just want to promote one thing. There's an individual that I that I follow a little bit. His name is Richard Werner. Have you ever heard of him? Mm, doesn't uh, sound familiar. He's in economics. Well, he he did uh, he he wrote the book "The Princes of of Yen," of the Yen. I think it is the Princes of the Yen, and he studied Japanese economics after uh, after Hiroshima, and he breaks down the whole central banking system. But he's very simplistic because I can understand them. And I watched a video last night, a short one, uh, a half hour, and it's uh, the bank, uh, 
the banks make money out of nothing. And it's the underground revolutionary is the, uh, I guess, the YouTube provider, I guess. And I follow him and I spoke about Catherine Austin Fitz before she's got the Solari report. And she's the one that was in uh, underneath George Herbert Walker Bush's um, administration. She was assistant secretary to HUD, and she found $21 trillion missing from the Pentagon. And what she teaches is on how they're lulling us in right now into central bank digital currencies. And she really stepped up her um, her teaching, I'm going to say, because I find her on YouTube. And, but, you know, I don't have the money to pay for her uh, newsletter, I'm sorry to say. But um, it, it, ever since the trucker strike up in uh, Canada, she really stepped it up. And she has relationships with RFK and um, Richard Werner. She, she teaches about Richard Werner. And there's one other individual that I think is totally extraordinary, a young woman. She's in her 30s. Her name is Whitney Webb, and she is an investigative reporter along with Mark Goodwin, and she does videos, and she breaks down, like, what they're doing about Bitcoin. I know you spoke years ago about Bitcoin. Did you ever, um, like, I, I have a, a slim understanding on what it's about with the blockchain and all that. Did you ever really drill down into that? Yeah, yeah, and really my point on Bitcoin is there's two different ways to look at Bitcoin. One, will it ever okay. be a viable way of buying things? Yes, you can buy some things right now. It's it's complicated. It, it's not a simple – you know, it's almost like when I was on SiriusXM, it was really easy for somebody to find me. They had a traditional okay. radio that they're used to. They turn to a channel. There's a show. You can listen to it. Now that I'm not on okay. Sirius XM anymore, you can still listen to me. The show's actually better, but it's much, much more difficult for somebody to find me now. It, it's, that's just, true. it's just not that simple. Um, that's the problem and, and, with Bitcoin and, for buying something right now. It's not simple. You don't hold a, a dollar bill in your wallet or a certain account in your bank and use a card. It's a whole new way of buying things. That's one issue. Will it become a viable right. currency? The other big issue well, that I try to warn people about, though, is many people look at Bitcoin as nothing but an investment. That is a really bad idea. Most people don't I have agree. the understanding of what, what the risk is. And even if you have the best understanding in the world, we have no history. One of the ways we make decisions in investing, what, what's the one investment I recommend all the time? The S&P 500 index fund, correct? Correct. We have about a hundred years of how that reacts to everything in the market. If interest rates are going to go up, here's what's going to happen. If cost right. inflation is going to go down, here's what's going to happen. We have a hundred years to look at that investment and say, here's how that investment reacts when this occurs. And even with that, we're still not very good at predicting where it's going. But with Bitcoin, no. we have no history to speak of whatsoever. It, and I just warn people no. that investing in anything like that is not amateur hour. You will get your ass handed to I, you I, uh, nine I, times I out of ten. I agree with that. I think, I think a lot of the investing is being done out of fear. And um, this is why I, I, um, I'm kind of talking about Whitney Webb. She does – a deep dive into BlackRock and BlackRock's not really that good, <laughs> you know, on, on the power that they have and what they've been doing, just what they did under COVID on how they swooped in and, you know, they, they bought a lot of land. They bought a lot of property. I, I, and with what I'm talking about, see, Kev, when I was young, I hated control. And I, that's what gave me the ability to, uh, uh, what's, step outside of group think. And 
and, and like I know we promote here, you know, why. I know not only would ask why, I would ask how. How did that happen in order for me to want to ask why? And doing that, you, I would see a lot of things like, now I, I, don't, I don't want to get into the whips, but, you know, BlackRock on who's connected to them, and she breaks down, you know, behind Jamie Dimon. She really gets into the weeds with uh, Jeffrey Epstein on how, you know, all the yeah, pedophile hey, stuff. Hey, and hey. I, I, I know, Ken. I yeah, know this, that, this, but I, this I, is the kind of stuff I stay away I, from because you can never solve this. Okay. We could talk about this right. on the well, air. I, for... I, 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 uh, give me one more minute. Though. I, I just want to say this. I believe that the, they are de-dollarizing the dollar. And what Catherine ex, you know, teaches about, uh, Richard Werner teaches about, and Whitney Webb, just about Bitcoin and everything. Because if, they, if we don't have the dollar, what Catherine teaches right very simplistically after the strike in Canada is that because how they debanked how you know uh, Trudeau debanked them up there with one you know one switch that we have to have cash and if we have cash and we use cash which I I believe it's it's it would be very very hard if not impossible to transition back to that you know, but when we have cash, we can slow things down for what's happening. And I, I, I know I kind of got into the weeds there and everything. And I, I, you know, I, I just would like to see this industry because I believe the trucking industry has the most power over any other job that you can have within this country. And, you know, and, and especially with the way they're sticking together. But I just want to dovetail into what my friend told me about the unions. They they uh, they a tentative agreed until January fifteenth at sixteen at six dollars an hour increase. And what they're fighting is what was already accomplished out in Long Beach. And he said you can go on YouTube and you can literally see the automation on how it's already been implemented there. And that's what the main drive is here to, yeah, and, you know, and, uh, slow things down on the East Coast. Yeah, and, and I talked about that. And if people want to understand why you have to modernize, it's not an option. You, you just read, it's read, true. Read the book but, we just talked about. But, but, because that's the only way to generate new wealth. We have to modernize. Right. We have to get they more efficient. We have to increase production. In, in, in law- there were 800 jobs that were lost in Long well, Beach well, in well, order to well, implement. Danny, here's and, and you got to yeah. read the book. Can anybody tell me the book is about not looking at short term and not looking at one right. group? We have to look long term. Right. We have to look at the impacts Correct. over the entire economy. Everybody knows 800 right. jobs were lost. It's obvious. It's right there in front of us. They reported it. How come nobody right. talks about how many jobs were created i get you i got you nobody talks about it but that, you, that's the whole point i can't I, tell I, you how many jobs were created because nobody talks about it but were jobs created right. absolutely they had to be if there's a machine sure. that's going to take over a human's job who built the machine who built the factory that built the machine who delivered yeah. all the parts to I, make that factory who delivered all the parts to make the machine after the factory was made there were a lot of jobs created, probably more than the 800 jobs that were lost. I, I, I agree with that. But see, Kev, just for me to identify a little more, I listened to the teaching that you provide with Joel Salatin with, uh, you know, with all of the control issues that are all around us and that we're involved in, in the, the industry. The, and like when I say I go back to how – you know, I started holding the steering wheel in 1975 under Jimmy Carter. I I finally got to buy. I went driving a straight truck, pedaling. You know the five burrows, the, working LTL off the piers. Let, let, but then let, I graduated until Reagan let, got in, and let, I was able to buy my first brand new truck in 1979. And it, it was still just trying to recover the interest rate on that fifty thousand dollar brand new truck. The cab over freight liner was 22 percent. 
No, I, I no. never got the, for the truck. They, they wound up hey, taking it. Hey, Danny, got to cut you loose. We could, uh, we can get way off into the weeds on that. Hey, one of the things I, we should stay focused on, if modernization is so bad, and, and I've heard this, and this is a tough issue. Well, of course, they're going to fight automation because they'll lose jobs. But every time we've automated things, we get more jobs. It's kind of like this argument you get from the socialist. Well, I know socialism has failed every single time it's been tried, but this time it will be different. It's the same thing. We, I hear people say, well, it doesn't matter if every time we've modernized, we ended up with more jobs. This time's different. That, that's the argument that's being made. But it's never been different. That that's one of the things when you look historically, I, I don't know if at some point it, it seems logical that if we keep putting people out of jobs, there's we're going to run out of jobs for people to do. But it never happens. And it really is the only way we create new wealth is to increase production and efficiency. Let's go to Iowa. Brad. What's on your mind today? Let me try that again. There we go. Yeah, I try, to, try to lighten the mood a little bit here. I was going to have some suggestions for the store. Okay. If you don't mind. Sure. Uh, maybe a shirt that has a picture of yourself, Bruce, and Mike Beckett on there. And one of them says, you know, Mike says, does it have chrome on it? Kevin Rutherford asks, does it have cardio miracle? Do you take cardio miracle? And then Bruce Malice is saying, are you running the catalyst? <laughs> <laughs> that would be the a good one. Of left truck. That would be a good one. I like that. Just need to figure something out for uh, Henry and Joel, though. Yeah. Um, the, re- the reason I was calling is, I think I called here a while back, uh, I have a health question. I uh, finally got myself weaned off the paroxetine, and I was going to see if there was anything in your store or uh something else that work in its place because since I have been off, I've noticed my temper is a lot shorter than it used to be. Okay. So I didn't know if there was something like a supplement or something that would work in its place. Um, not directly, but we can certainly talk about what, what's going on. Let's go back. When were you prescribed? Is, is this Paxil? Yes, it is. When, when were you prescribed that? 2013. So, what would, if you can think back to 2013, what was the symptom that led you and the doctor to come up with this drug? What, what, what problem well, were you trying to solve in 2013 when he prescribed the drug? Well, I kind of, I, this is me, just from what I can remember, my wife just told me my temper was short and I was kind of irritable and she thought I should try to get some on something to help take care of it. So wow. me personally, I don't know what I was doing, but my wife kind of felt like I needed some help. And, uh, so I went to the doctor and told her what, I, what she said. And it's kind of, that's how it got prescribed to me. Wow. So we actually, we've, so we've, come feels- to the, we've come to the place in this country where we now think emotions are disease. Yeah. And that some well, some and, and, toxic drug is going to fix our emotions. Yeah. And then not really in her defense, but in her defense, uh, we had just had two new children and, you know, stress of work and everything else. And I been, may have been a little bit short at the time for a couple conversations. But regardless, I was on it for 10 years. I finally got myself weaned off. It took a while and kind of got past the the what do you call it? The nips and the zips, you know, I kind of feel like your brain's flying apart. And oh, I, I, I've noticed that my, now my, my temper is a lot shorter than it used to be. <laughs> so in it, it, would you say it's worse than it was in 2013? I can't remember that far back to be honest with you. My guess is it <laughs> might be. So we exacerbated the problem more than anything. Um, first off, before yeah. we talk about any supplements whatsoever, and there really are no supplements that, will do what this drug did. That's a good thing because, because this drug did nothing good. There was no pot. There was no upside to this drug. I know sometimes you might feel like, well, I wasn't so angry and, um, but you didn't fix anything here. We are a decade later and we have to deal with it again. Yeah. And, and we have the side effects of the drug. The drug altered the way your brain works. Mm-hmm. 
And that, and that's evident in the I'm fact still. that it's so hard to quit. And it is hard to quit. So congratulations. Yeah. Let's talk about your diet before we talk about supplements. Carnivore. Pure wow. carnivore. With uh, maybe every once in a while, if I have a hankering for something other than meat, and it may be some uh, broccoli roasted in butter and How long have you things been of that nature. That no bread. Oh, I think I started this back in 2020. And what were the results? What changed when you well, changed? Well, my the heaviest, I was at 250. And now I'm at 208. And I've been kind of, I stopped at 208. And I think I called you here a couple months back asking you if Paxil was known to halt weight loss. And you said it had. So I kind of started to wean myself off that as well. Yeah, it, well, it absolutely does. All SSRIs are, are one of the side effects is weight gain. We know that because it messes with hormones. Weight gain or loss is all about hormones and not calories. That's why we don't talk about calories. Everybody else does. It doesn't work. We talk about hormones. Any drug that interferes with your home hormones is going to interfere with weight loss or weight gain. And, and this, is, this is affecting your hormones. That's why we've got the anger. Have you had your um, testosterone levels checked? I have not. That might be something I would recommend here. Um, I would also recommend um, adding some carbs back into your diet. If you're really hardcore okay. carnivore, and it sounds like you might be, we might want to experiment with, say, 50 grams of carbs a day or less. And, and make sure they're not, okay. you know, grains. Uh, white rice is fine. Some fruit is fine. Some honey is okay. Maple syrup you know, some, some veggies yep. that you might like it. And I, I wouldn't worry too much about the carbs right now. I try to add maybe 50 grams back in. Um, let's see what happens with that. Are you using, um, any coconut oil or mind fuel? Yes, I am. Which one? I, Both. Um, well, it's not, what's it's, uh, so bulletproof coffee that ends is the oil that you put in your coffee in the morning. I take that every morning. Okay. So, well, there's two. There's MCT oil or XCT oil and Bulletproof's brand and our mind fuel. Are you using a, a okay. blend or are you using a pure the bottle. No, the bottle I have is probably from, no, it's probably from about a year ago. So I've been nursing through it here quite a while, taking about, you know, just a shot of it in my coffee every day. Yeah, I, I would, I would try. Oh, I think, I'm pretty sure it's Bulletproof. I, I would try the mind fuel we have in our store. That's pure C8. And I would put up to two tablespoons a day in your coffee. And, and the reason I'm saying that is it is mind fuel creates ketones. I mean, that, that's the point of, of consuming pure C8 instead of just coconut oil. Coconut oil makes ketones. Pure C8 makes even more. It makes them faster. Ketones are really good for our brain. And you're dealing with the brain issue right now. But what we know is that brain issues are not chemical imbalances. That's, that's why drugs don't work. They're, they're a Band-Aid at best. Um, we need to get your hormones back in balance, not just – we can't affect these neurotransmitters directly. We have to get your hormones back in balance, testosterone being the big one. So I, I would check to see what your – um, testosterone levels are. I would add the brain octane, and we talked about it earlier. I would add the cardio miracle. I do think that there yeah, are. I do some, take that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Now, if if yeah. if you don't okay. see any movement in, in mood or anger in thirty days of this, I would give this thirty days, and I would get your testosterone levels checked. Uh, and if nothing really improves in 30 days, then I would recommend a Nutri-Q, and we're probably going to have to do more blood work. Okay. All right. Well, I'll give that a shot. All right. Thanks for the call. All right. We are going to wrap this up for today. Um, I've got some things I've got to get on with, and uh, we will see you back here tomorrow for the Power Hour. Be safe. Be profitable. Be fit and healthy. Always do the hard work and master the journey.